All right. I don't know why I get this one all the time, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's amazing since I started in, uh, you know, I grew up on a farm, so uh, cow poop, pig poop, people poop is no big problem. We used to raise dogs too, so you know, I'm into poop. But uh, you know, it's interesting when you watch fiber that people really got away from poop as learning, you know, because you think, what can I learn from looking at poop? So if you go back to the 70s and all the collection of fecal samples, weighing fecal samples, looking at transit time, once we got more interested in cholesterol, people stopped looking at fecal samples. So when you get into how much data do we have on laxation, what kind of studies, and uh, it, it was good to read, if you've read the FDA background on uh, how many fibers can actually get a claim for laxation, it's not very many because there haven't been uh, lots of studies that have looked at it. So uh, it's uh, nice to be here to talk to you guys about this. So here is my confession, and I was told three years. So if you did something with me four years ago and you're not up here, sorry about that. But uh, I mentioned yesterday and the day before when people said it's really hard to get uh, nutrition studies funded through NIH. It's like, yeah, duh. Uh, that's absolutely true. Nutrition studies are hard to get funded through NIH. So these are just some of the people that have funded our research over the last three years, and I really appreciate them uh, working with us. Uh, most of what we do is fiber is still our base business, but whole grains, uh, legumes, pulses, uh, some of our recent studies on FODMAPs, uh, uh, nutrient losses in deep winter greenhouses. So we're interested in doing anything we can to solve nutrition problems. We're doing a mushroom study right now, looking at mushrooms and gut health, mostly digestive health. I do a lot of stuff on protein, and that is I'm a human nutritionist, so if you give me what nutrient do you want first? I want water, then I want protein. I don't really care about carbohydrates or fat. I don't think it matters that much at the end of the day. So I'm really interested in protein right now. And we're also doing some work on snacking and dietary patterns. I uh, am on the scientific advisory board for Tate and Lyle, carry ingredients, Atkins, just to show I have no real focus on uh, carbohydrates. I hang with the fat and protein people too, and the Midwest Dairy Association. And I own a third share of the Slavin Sisters Farm, LLC, a 119 acre farm in Walworth, Wisconsin that is rented. And uh, our crops this year are the same. We have some corn, soybeans, and pumpkins, 20 acres. So if you're there in the fall, come visit. So George, uh, Kathy, uh, Patricia talked about that this meeting's been going on for a long time and these three things that we accept that fiber does, okay, we accept that, but how about as far as gut health and laxation? Number four, increased fecal bulk and laxation, transit time, colonic fermentation and short chain fatty acids, and the modulation of colonic microflora. So these were, all of these fit into this overall gut health category that, that uh, fiber should have an effect on these. So what does fiber do? Fiber is amazing because it works throughout the digestive tract, right? So uh, through chewing, all these things, and, and when we look at fiber, the form of fiber being important, uh, we did some uh, interesting studies. Uh, Holly Willis, one of my former students on gastric emptying, real foods versus a liquid diet supplemented with fiber, and there were differences in gastric emptying with the real food diet versus the, the liquid diet with just fiber added to it. Uh, lots of work on gut hormones trying to figure out those mechanisms, but mostly what we're going to talk about today is fermentation, what happens in the large intestinal tract. So once fiber gets there, uh, 12 hours after you swallow it, uh, what happens for the next day and a half? So fermentation potentially, production of short-chain fatty acids, changes in the microbiota, and changes in pH. So here's what people don't like to do. Uh, in this research, you really need to collect fecal samples to get any information. Um, do we have to look or do we have to measure? So these are some of the, the Bristol stool charts of actually looking at fecal samples. And I, I do want to uh, tell you, we just did a study on oatmeal in kids and looking at fecal samples. Uh, and Richard Black, a good friend of mine, uh, used to work at Kraft, uh, PepsiCo that uh, PepsiCo funded this study said, why don't we take pictures of the fecal samples in the toilet and then they'll send them to you, right? 
Sounds like a great idea, right? So then we're judging these fecal samples after these kids have taken pictures. And it's, it's a good way of getting information. We need to start thinking of creative ways of getting information. Most people will tell you about it, but uh, it's actually pretty hard to get. So these are some of the general ways of looking at size of fecal samples, how big, what's the magic size, and then what's the magic composition. So uh, uh, there are different charts out here that are validated. They're really not validated in different age groups, so we run into some challenges there. So how much gets broken down? This is a really tough question, because how do we look at it in and out? So we measure fiber in, we measure fiber out. Fiber out, what's mostly there is a lot of bacterial cell walls that are difficult to measure. So this whole area is quite uh, complicated, but overall, if you look at the data that's out there, certain fibers, pectin and inulin, are extensively fermented. You know, very quickly gone, you cannot find them in the fecal samples. Um, otherwise, other fibers, and this is my uh, PhD thesis, so I've got a lot of experience on purified cellulose, is poorly fermented. So about 90% of it is still there at the end of the ride. So, and all of those are fiber, right? So if you think of uh, laxation, would you expect differences among those fibers? Absolutely. Um, so what happens though in feces, they're always about 75% water. So the surviving fiber or the bacteria increases the fecal weight because it binds water. And there's some really good studies from the 70s by Allison Stevens and John Cummings where they looked at different soluble fibers and insoluble fibers and fecal weight and even fibers that were 100% fermented did increase stool weight because they bound fiber uh, or bound uh, water and increased stool size. So yeah, how are we going to rank these? So if you're at the horse track, I mean, who are you going to bet on? Um, wheat bran. I always bet on wheat bran. And because uh, the studies, first of all, there's a lot of studies out there. And wheat bran does, it, some of it gets broken down, but a lot of it survives. And it does tend to get uh, broken down throughout the digestive tract, the, the gut. So maybe up to five grams per gram of fiber fed. Oats data, three to four and a half. Legumes. Uh, and remember, there's not a lot of studies. Dr. Cummings put this data together a long time ago, and as we try to add to it, these studies are not done in the same way. It's actually fairly, uh, you know, use this, uh, there's some variability here that you need to assume. Pectins and novel fibers, maybe only like one to one. So I give you a gram of fiber, I might get an increase in one gram of fecal. Uh, our own study, we did an inulin study, it was one per gram of fiber fed. So there's a big range in how much fecal weight you're going to get per gram of fiber fed. Um, there have been a couple of recent studies, and I really appreciate uh, people funding these studies. I think Ann Burkett is in the, the audience here uh, from Kellogg, has in, been involved in some of these studies to look at pulling all this data together and updating it. As there's been an interest in stool weight as a biomarker and transit time as a biomarker, what kind of information is out there? So uh, this study that was published in 2015, they looked at 65 intervention studies of serial fiber and bowel function, and these measures stool weight, stool frequency and consistency, total transit time. Um, there were not enough non-wheat fiber studies to include. So when people say, what about corn fiber? What about oat fiber? There really wasn't enough body of evidence to uh, summarize it in a meta-analysis. Wheat fiber increased stool weight 3.7 grams per gram fiber fed. So a little less than some of the older research on that. Uh, stool frequency, not much. You saw very little change on stool frequency. And transit time decreased by 0.78 hours among those with an initial transit time greater than 48 hours. Uh, now, wh what do you think about 48 hours? 48 hours is the normal transit time. So it takes about 12 hours for stuff to get down to the gut, large intestine, but it takes about two days for stuff to get all the way through. And if you ever have opened an animal up and look at the, uh, the large intestine, there's tons of mixing. There's a lot going on down there. So things, uh, when you're looking at pellets and uh, passage of pellets through the large intestine, you know, there's a lot of mixing, things going back and forth, but if you look at how long does it take for those pellets to pass, Normal subjects, about two days is average. Uh, this was a similar study, except they looked at vegetable and fruit fiber and fecal weight and transit time. So cereal fiber and vegetable fibers had comparable effects on fecal weight, both more than fruit fiber. 
Now remember, these studies are not done. I mean, like when you give fruit, how good is the a measurement of how much fiber? So there's going to be some uh, slop in this data. But uh, less fermentable fibers had more effect on stool weight, which you would expect. If you look at the wheat bran versus inulin pectin data, that's not too surprising. Fiber did not change transit time in those with initial transit times of 48 hours or less. And this is the hard thing about using transit time as the biomarker. So FDA is using transit time and stool frequency. If you have normal subjects and you give them fiber, it's very likely you're not going to see a change in transit time. Uh, when transit time was greater than 48 hours, transit time was reduced by 30 minutes per gram of fiber regardless of fermentability. So people with longer transit times, there seemed to be more effect with fiber than people with what would be considered a normal transit time. Really difficult work to do to get this information. Transit time is measured in different ways. So um, I want to talk a little bit about some other studies in resistance starch that kind of get at how much stuff gets broken down during uh, passage. Um, Four sources of resistant starch were studied in 12 subjects over 15-day feeding periods. And for these different resistant starches, uh, very big differences in effect on stool weight. So uh, for potato, 1.6, uh, going up to 4.8 for a brand that was uh, actually, you know, when they were comparing that resistant starch. So when we, even to look at a category of fiber and say, okay, how much will we get with resistant starch? It, you know, it could be anywhere from uh, 1.6 uh, up to similar to what you have with wheat bran. Um, this is what's really important, and I learned this in the last two days, that always in nutrition studies you have more individual variability than you do the effect of diet. So when you obviously need a lot of subjects and you need a lot of diet or nutrition to show an effect because you have a lot of variability and this is always a frustrating thing in humans no matter how you try to uh, recruit your subjects you're going to have a lot of individual variability. Um, in this study, this coming study in 96, resistant starch was extensively fermented as a rule but five subjects were unable to break down certain resistant starch sources at all no effect at all, most of them extensively fermented. These are normal subjects, what's the difference? Obviously they have different uh, bugs in their microbiota. Um, fecal short chain fatty acids uh, went up, resistant starch two from potato and banana produced more acetate, while resistant starch three from wheat and maize produced more propionate. Uh, resistant starch had mild laxative properties, probably by stimulating biomass excretion. So even with fermentation, fermentation happens, but uh, short-chain fatty acids get produced, uh, gut microbiota increase, and they're going to bind water, and there is an increase in biomass, even if fiber doesn't survive. Um, so this is uh, kind of my bottom line, trying to look at all this data and, and summarize it. Different fibers have different effects on stool weight. That's abs I've said it many times, so whenever people come and say, under oath, is that a fact? That is a fact. There's no question about that. But I believe that a properly powered study will show differences in stool weight with fiber intake. And that's why I think stool weight is a really important biomarker because of uh, if you power your study, even if you're only going to get 1.5 grams per gram of fiber, if you have enough subjects and give enough fiber, you will show a significant effect. It is very possible to do that, but there are lots of studies out there that don't show an effect. So if you go out and some of them have my name on them, so I'm an offender for sure, uh, that there, if you give a highly fermentable fiber to a small number of subjects and a small amount of fiber, you're not going to see a significant effect. Stool frequency does not change if a frequency is normal. And this is the problem with using stool frequency for the FDA you know, biomarker is that it really doesn't change if you're already once per day. Even if I give you a lot of fiber, I don't typically get two or three out of you a day. It just doesn't do that. So the studies don't support that. So stool frequency is really hard to change. Now people would say, well, let's get people that have really low stool frequencies. And that's what we were trying to do on our oatmeal study. We're trying to recruit uh, kids that had less than seven per week, right? So we said, we need you to be in the five to six range. 
We screened them, yep, they were five to six, came into the study, they were seven and eight, right? So stool frequency, you know, most people are once per day. That's an average thing in normal subjects. So if you say, let's go get constipated people, that's disease, guys. <laughs> so as soon as you say, let's get constipated people, you're not working in normal subjects and your data is not gonna be useful for this fiber substantiation anyway, because you need to show it in healthy people. If transit time is normal, two days, 48 hours, additional fiber will not change transit time. And uh, I think we've seen this in a lot of studies. I went back and read some of my advisor's studies that were published back in 2000, uh, Marlette's study looking at oats. And uh, she had a very good discussion in there that if transit time is normal, what does, uh, transit, what does fiber do? It normalizes transit time. Yeah, so if you're at, you know, if you're at, if you have diarrhea, fiber can actually help in the diarrhea and, and normalize your transit time. It's pretty amazing that it can help on both ends of the spectrum. But if you're doing a study and the, the biomarker that is allowed to you is uh, transit time, most of the fibers that you make and give to people, you're not going to see a change in transit time if, if everybody's at two anyway. So it's actually a really hard uh, uh, place to get to. Um, and this is this Harvey paper from Lancet in 73. Fiber intakes will normalize transit two, two to four days, even with people that, and you think, who's got more than four days? Some of those old research studies, they show people that had transit times of up to seven days. That, that's how long it takes to get things through the gut. So, limitations to fecal samples. They're not really practical in epidemiological studies. One of the issues we got into with the microbiota study too is just a spot sample of one fecal sample doesn't typically tell you very much. So usually like for transit time, you have to actually collect five days worth of fecal samples. Uh, that's a big participant burden. So in an epidemiological study, we don't have information on fecal samples. They haven't been collected in these large perspective studies. So uh, why was the fiber recommendation uh, set with cardiovascular data? Because we have good cardiovascular data on these large prospective cohort studies, higher intakes of fiber protective against cardiovascular disease, and it's consistent with, with what you would see with laxation, but the laxation data really doesn't exist to come up with the same numbers. Um, no accepted standard. I vote for stool weight. And the reason I vote for stool weight, and it isn't one that FDA is uh, currently supporting. They are supporting transit time and frequency. I think stool weight makes sense because it works, right? I give you fiber, you, it, and when I give you that amount of fiber, I can measure an increase in stool weight, and I believe that that is what will affect laxation and make things go through quicker and uh, increase fermentation. So the benefits of more fiber, I think, get shown with stool weight. Lots of things to measure in stool that, you know, we could say these are the most important. We don't have any data that there is uh, all these other things we can look at. Uh, um, pH, uh, short chain fatty acids are great indicators of a health outcome, so we have some limitations there. Uh, having spent two days listening to methods to measure the microflora and the microbiota, some real challenges there. If we could get some markers in that area that would be linked to health, that would be fabulous. Um, stool frequency, the advantage is we can get that easily, right? People can collect that data on stool frequency. So that is one of the, you know, what FDA would say is that's a pretty easy study to do to show changes in stool frequency. Problems being um, it's actually hard to get that information. The, a lot of the irritable bowel trials look at quality of life and quality of life, which uh, biology people think of as really soft measures, but if people's bowel function is working, uh, then they're pretty happy. So why not use that? So if some type of fiber supplement makes people feel better, if their quality of life goes up, uh, why not use that as an indicator? Um, other things, and this is what Paula said, remember that there are fiber fermentation provides physiological benefits with increased mineral absorption. And that's an advantage to show, okay, that because of that, that's a physiological benefit, you can use that. The prebiotic world, very supportive of that, but needing more information that there's a uh, benefit to that. Uh, things on changes in uh, pathogenic bacteria and then just the role of short chain fatty acids in uh, the colon, and you're going to hear more about that from other speakers. 
Um, this was a, a review on short-chain fatty acids. Um, remember, ruminants make most of them, but monogastrics always also make them. Rapidly absorbed and metabolized, so they're really hard to study in vivo in a human. Remember, humans, the nice thing about animals is we can deconstruct them and ask questions that we can't do in humans. So in humans, we're really limited. 70% um, of ruminant calories, 10% for humans. And so this calorie, uh, how many calories do I actually get from uh, short-chain fatty acid production uh, could be fairly significant if we increase fiber. Um, some of the highly fermentable fibers could be, uh, right now, the new proposed guidelines, 2K calories per gram for soluble and zero for insoluble, which uh, you could argue is not exactly right. And lots of things are affected by short-chain fatty acids. So incredibly important compounds, but a direct link to a health outcome still lacking. Um, chemical structure of fiber. I'm a total believer in food. I really like food. Um, so uh, solubility of fiber, important, but uh, there's much to it than that. Uh, viscosity, for sure. If you get into the cholesterol lowering, glucose, viscosity, and important. Fermentation, no, I mean, I'm in the fermentation world. I totally buy into it, but how do you link it to a physiological benefit? So that's really the challenge there. Physical structure, incredibly important. So I know our own studies on gastric emptying, you know, comparing food to liquid diets where uh, fiber were added, we know there are differences. So how do we get at that? That's a much harder thing to study, but uh, getting fiber into food, really important. I always have to end on this because if you go into the laxation field, everything affects laxation. So if I called you up here and said, okay, you're going to have to sing a song, I can tell you that's going to affect your transit time, right? Uh, unless you're really good, maybe it'll be good. <laughs> Exercise for sure absolutely affects laxation. Smoking, coffee drinking, when people give up habits, what makes them go to the bathroom? If you've had toddlers, how do you train kids to go to the bathroom when it's convenient? There's so much psychological stuff in laxation that we have ignored for way too long. We really need to uh, take that more importantly. Drugs, laxatives, obviously. And then I have to bring this one up, this personality study, because uh, being up in the, the Midwest, and these are my friends up at USDA, up at Grand Forks, and what they found, when you do these controlled feeding studies, everybody eats the same food, you would expect the same poop, right? They're on the same diet. You know, they have the same amount of food. They're the same size people. Let's look at poop. Uh, I know, I grew up on a dairy farm. All the cows had the same access to food, and every cow has a different poop pattern. They really do, and some of them poop a lot more. It's absolutely true in humans, too. And when they tried to say it's not linked to fiber, it's not linked to calories, what is it linked to? The biggest predictor was personality. So outgoing people had much bigger stools than uptight people, and that was the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. So just to point out how hard it is to do these studies. Um, and then this whole thing on digestive health, it's a very big thing of what's normal, um, absence of digestive disease, normal bowel function between three per day and three per week is considered normal. What's the magical stool weight? We should know this. We're the fiber people. We should say if you have a 200 gram stool, you are good to go. You're going to live forever. And if we had that data, we'd be in a really good spot here. We wouldn't have to have the 12th Fahuni conference. We're like 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 conference. For like a prince, 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 for like a prince for like a prince for like a prince for like a prince for like balls. So most of we think in the fiber world we want fermentation, yay, more fiber. The FODMAP world is kind of on the opposite end and that fermentation is the enemy, not the friend. So if you get into the FODMAP world, uh, all the lists of foods that are high in FODMAPs are things that are uh, high in fermentable carbohydrates. So as people you know, accept this diet, it's kind of similar to a low gluten diet. People believe that it will get rid of their symptoms 
symptoms. Um, uh, it, it is kind of the negative side of fermentation. So I would give it to you as a watch out as you're developing carbohydrates that are highly fermentable and affect microbiota. Uh, there is this whole group of people that think that that is not positive, that that's a negative. Okay, this is just the definition of that. And so my conclusions. Digestive health is poorly defined. Poorly digested carbohydrates alter digestive health. Fiber has an accepted role in digestion. So the nice thing about fiber is I am a, as George pointed out, I am a nutrient of concern. We need to take more in. We have recommendations. I'm on the nutrition facts panel. I have a lot of positives uh, moving forward. People need to get more fiber. I believe, and uh, I know that FDA does not, that stool weight is the most objective measure of fiber's effect on laxation. Even when laxation is normal, fiber intake will increase stool weight, although cereal fibers that are poorly fermented are most successful increasing stool weight. Stool frequency and transit time are generally not changed in normal subjects who consume additional fiber. So using those as your marker of this is a fiber that can be in that isolated fiber puts you a bit in a box because it's hard to use that as your, uh, as your measure. And novel fibers may not change stool frequency or transit time in healthy individuals, but may increase stool weight. Stool weight should be an accepted standard for a physiological benefit of fiber. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Any uh, questions for Joanne? We have time for a couple questions if you'd like to ask. Go ahead to the microphone, please. And Barbara has one. Go ahead. State your name have, first. Baha uh, <laughs> Tahiri, General Mills. Um, I have two questions for you. The first is, would you recommend um, a selection of subjects for in the trials that are not high consumers or normal consumers of fibers? Uh, and what would be that cutoff for the fiber intake? And the second question is around conservation. Um, would that be, uh, we heard Paula earlier, would that be a condition that is actually linked to the benefit um, that would be acceptable? Or would we, is this really clear that this is considered as a disease? Because I really see a link between constipation and relaxation. So Totally, yeah. Well, thank you. That we generally, what we do is we screen people that are no more than average, which is easy to find. So people that are 15 grams or less. So if you got people uh, that were already consuming 60 grams of fiber, you could give them more, but that would, wouldn't make any sense. So I think to design a study, you want people that are, but, but are willing to eat fiber, because a lot of people just don't like fiber, so it's hard to get that in. Um, you know, the constipation thing was actually an uh, issue that came up with I our IRB, because originally when we were designing this study, we said that slightly, what are we going to call people that don't have stools every day? And so we thought, well, you know, could we say uh, that their parents thought they were slightly constipated or something along those lines? And that was like, no, that's disease, and those people should be with a physician, they shouldn't be dealing with nutrition. So I think that's a hard thing in laxation. And remember, the official definitions are three per day or three per week are considered normal, so you don't even have to call yourself constipated. Um, so I think that's the, uh, it'll be interesting to see what, F and here's an expert from FDA, so Barbara can answer that. What they, uh, One more question. Yeah. Uh, retired from that. <laughs> and, and actually, I, I think the point that is important from the constipation discussion is to think about whether or not we're getting ourselves to a place where diet is not a factor in management of disease states. And you know that that may be the issue that we need to confront. But my, my question, first of all, thanks for a great presentation. No one does poop. <laughs> <laughs> That's my new tagline, Barbara. Thank you. Years ago, John Cummings made the assertion that dietary fiber non-digestible carbohydrates are the only dietary component that will increase stool weight. And I'm, I'm wondering, would you support that statement? Are, are we at the point where we can say, yeah, th this is why it's an essential part of the diet, because it's the only way you can really increase stool weight? 
Yeah, I think it's the really only healthy way to increase still weight. You know, there are other methods of non-digestible uh, fats and things that get in the way of digestion and absorption that can cause diarrhea, but that's not good quality of life. So I think it is that uh, non-digestible carbohydrates are the key for increasing stool weight and overall health. So I would agree with that. You know, obviously proteins, some of that's going to get down there too. That'll absorb some water, but th that's, it's the only way to get there. Okay. Maybe one more. Uh, we want to go to the break here. Oh, we just yeah. one more quickly. Real, real quick comment on the constipation issues. FDA has commented on constipation in dietary supplement type or structure function claims. And irregular bowel habits or occasional constipation is not considered a disease in that case. So is that an option? Or I mean, there's this issue of what is constipation because diagnosed constipation is a different mm -hmm. criteria than irregular. Right. And I think there is an opportunity to look at that. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with that, Dean, and I think it's, for us, it would be good not to use the word constipation because people on the IRB have said that's a disease. So other ways of saying slightly off uh, frequency, useful. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about the constipation. FDA does have the room three uh, chronic constipation definition, but I want to clarify this bit about fecal weight. So sometimes the studies say weight per stool, they're reporting, and some are weight per day. We do look at weight per day. So it's, it's the weight per stool. We view laxation as fecal output, not just how heavy the stool is. And so um, we do consider fecal weight, but it's, it's a measuring fecal output. It's a rate. And I appreciate that, Paula, because I really think that's what people are doing, these spot fecal samples, and those don't tell you anything. So that's why for transit time, you have to collect multiple days, and then you would have yes. stool weight per day. That data would be there. So, right. so I appreciate that. And, and we also understand the fact that there are these non-dietary factor uh, uh, variables like uh, personality and so forth, and that's why we value the crossover studies to be stronger than... I, I would totally agree that if you were going to design a study, a parallel study is not going to get you anywhere in laxation. You really have to do a crossover. So. Okay, thanks, Joanne. Yes. Thank you.